Welcome to the Live Waves webinar session by Arconvert, telling stories with paper featuring Kevin Shaw, founder of the world-renowned design agency, Stranger and Stranger. My name is Sharon Wu, and I'm the business development manager for Arconvert in the US. Now a bit about Kevin. Kevin founded Stranger and Stranger in 1991 to specialize in alcoholic beverage packaging. Stranger is now one of the leading firms in the field with studios in London, New York, and San Francisco. They advise everyone from huge corporations like Bacardi and Treasury down to one-man startups. Their labels account for over a billion bottles and cans a year, with winning hundreds of awards along the way. Stranger has created brands worth hundreds of millions of dollars. For questions, please use our chat box. We'll try to answer all of them at the end of the webinar. If we do not have time, we'll contact you directly. Our staff is here to provide technical support with any issues you may have during the presentation. Please message them in the chat. The webinar is being recorded and you'll all receive a video link in a follow-up email. And now I give the floor to Kevin Shaw. I love everyone. Um, thank you for joining wherever you happen to be. Let me get this. set up and um, hopefully you can see stranger and stranger um, as Sharon said it's been going for a while now and all this time we've been specializing a lot of the time in alcoholic beverages although more and more now we're doing other things like perfumes and um, cannabis and pine foods and things like that uh, so I'm the founder uh, there's 30 people now across the three studios and we have done over the years thousands and thousands of bottles. Uh, I'm, I lose count. Um, I should go through and count them again one more time. But uh, and all of that time, whether it be really fine wines or, or inexpensive wines or liquors or whatever, I, I look across all the labels that we've ever done, and predominantly uh, they are uh, paper labels. Um, there's all manner of options we do have, screening, all sorts of things, but the amount of paper that we use, I think, uh, it clearly overrides any other production technique, and there are good reasons for that. Um, I'm staggered about the production speeds now that happen in our industry, in the drinks industry. Uh, I think there's one machine that can label up 40 bottles per second, per second. Uh, and it's insane, the speeds, if you ever go down to these, these plants and see these things being bottled up, the speed that these things rattle through. Um, also, the printers. We're incredibly lucky in this industry to be able to use some of the best printers in the world. Uh, a few of them are, are down here near where I live, and you, they have 13 station presses. It's just, be, be, before I did packaging, and I did advertising and annual reports and things like that we were lucky to get four colors um, but 13 14 stations is insane so um, yeah and the, the papers themselves have to go through these machines at speed and then get applied to the bottles at incredible speed and I, and I thought a while a while ago that how amazing these papers are that we've been able to use now and all the techniques that we're able to apply that even a few years ago we weren't able to do and then, obviously, when these things get labelled up, they stick in, they get stuck in ice buckets, and the labels stay on. All these fancy things that we do, uh, almost um, indestructible now. There's an obvious reason that why we use paper in in our industry, and that is because we're not able to control the environment. Uh, bottles are stuck on shelves, there are bottles behind bottles, bottles are stuck behind bars with strange lighting. Uh, and if you're not careful with the finish and the way that you present things, then your stories are lost. So when we're doing redoing brands, this one in particular, we're, you know, we're keen to tell stories and we're keen to be evocative. And we can only do that if we can control the environment and the workspace. And that's, that's using paper. It allows us to add a lot more quality and finesse than silk screening onto a bottle. Uh, you get texture and you get a sensual feel when people pick things up. I spend a lot of time watching 
people with bottles and seeing how they react to the textures and uh, the finishes. If you get people stroking your bottle, there's a really good chance that they're going to take it home. Even when we're doing kind of minimal labels, and minimal pieces of paper, and we do this a lot if we've really got really lavish bottles. So if there's really tricky, interesting bottles, the, the label may become uh, subdued a little bit in order to let the bottle shine. But even then, we put in extra finishes and um, nothing, nothing, I don't, and nothing should be just regular. Nothing should be boring. You know, this, this paper is, has been uh, handmade with sugar kelp uh, because the, the product is made out of sugar kelp. This is a single color. It's one color, but it's debossed and hammered in, and it just looks as though it's a, a woodcut print. And even simple bottles that look as though it's just one color, um, these things are invariably not, not. I mean, that one color label, I think, is like six actual colors and a couple of embosses and stuff on top just to give it that depth. And we're able to do this now with, uh, with the print and the papers that we've got. They'll hold all these different finishes. We distress papers quite a lot, especially to make them look kind of old or used or just dug up. Um, fingerprints or sometimes things being imperfect have a layer of uh, authenticity. We burn them sometimes. And we even cover them with wax, um, which is just crazy. But I mean, lovely when you get the, the, the wax off and you can see the thing underneath. And sometimes there's an anti-label. It's just a bit of paper strapped to a bottle. Um, but it's still got that paper feel that adds a lot to it. Uh, debossing and embossing, we must do more than probably any other finish, whether it be blind embossing, debossing onto handmade paper, uh, debossing and embossing all together. And, and a revelation for us recently, um, certainly in the last few years, has been uh, sculpted embosses. So g giving, pay, giving getting that depth around embosses, which, uh, which you couldn't do up until recently. I remember when I first started doing these things, the level of embossing was really fundamental and basic. And you get to tell so much rich story when you've got that texture and depth. Color, obviously standing out on a shelf is absolutely vital to us. Uh, and the color ideas can come from anywhere. The clients that we get, sometimes they're big kind of corporate clients with well-researched briefs. And sometimes it's just uh, a guy walking in off the street with an idea. Um, this guy had stuck some bananas in a whiskey and then pulled the bananas out later and it tasted great And I have to say it's absolutely delicious and everybody that we that we try that we tasted on thinks it's amazing uh, But it had this kind of weird. It's not a snobby whiskey. So we did this visual um, These are basically how our visuals look and that's the finished bottle pretty close a couple of changes, but nothing much um, but to be able to flood this thing with color that when it when you see it in store, it just dominates um, and um, It's in, since been picked up. It's now on fire. It's going to do a hundred thousand cases I think in its first year uh, Purely because of the fact that all this label or the label color will be able to flood into everything else uh, And you've got to think about now um, an online presence and how your bottle looks and how your label looks when you're ordering it online or whether it's on somebody's feed. Um, and paper allows you to really dominate all that. Everything is down to that paper label. We've done this a lot and you'll see in luxury goods like Tiffany, uh, they own certain colors. Verve Clico is, uh, is, owns an orange that no other sparkling wine can use. It actually owns a color. And if you try and infringe on that color, on a paper label um, that you'll find lawyers all over you. Uh, so paper allows them to really dominate with that. We metalize paper quite a lot, uh, whether it be kind of small bits of metal or um, more intricate bits. 
These are roots that look like silhouettes. This is, again, one of those deceptively, uh, well, simple looking jobs that is that took up the whole 13 stations. Uh, we were trying to make it look like there's a gold seam in the ground. big areas of metal that we then print on top of. Um, this is something that you can only do with paper uh, effectively, um, but you can get a real richness by laying down a foil and then printing over the top of it, or even making it look like metal. That's, that's just a paper label, but it looks like metal. And this is, um, I think, one of the most uh, vivid labels we've ever done. Uh, and it's a pearlized, metallized paper to substrate. And then we put pearlized ink on top of it. And it just shimmers and goes crazy on a shelf. Um, but again, it's something that we couldn't have done even a few years ago to this effect. And then I think one of the, one of the really uh, most important developments, I think, is being able to get strength in paper that allows us to wrap around bottles. Uh, so again, something we couldn't have done that long ago. So you can tell stories by wrapping a label all the way around. Um, this, this label tells the story of, uh, of a grape varietal, uh, Malbec, and how it kind of started out in France and then got killed off and re-established itself in Argentina. Uh, and to be able to tell that story with such richness, on a label that goes almost the whole length of the bottle that wraps around without any imperfections whatsoever is incredible. And it's just testament to the, to the technology and the paper that we have these days that we can do these things. As designers, it allows us to be incredibly free with our ideas and just think as we do in the studio that, that anything can be achieved. We just have to figure out how. This is a label about um, two varietals that don't really belong in the same bottle. They kind of work, but they don't really belong in the same bottle, or you haven't seen them in the same bottle. And uh, so this, this jewel is played out over the different bottles. And this is what the concept looked like. I think the flat label is hilarious. I mean, it just, it's the way that this wraps around. It's just really, really interesting. And you see people kind of holding it and turning it around. And I think one of the one of the brands that we've really been able to tell stories with on multiple SKUs, and this brand is now it started out as a tiny little kind of thing, but it's uh, you'll see with the SKUs that I'm just about to show how diverse and interesting this idea has become. So the the idea behind this was that you know this guy was the Spaniard was in the Philippines and he got lost in the jungle, and you can see what's happening. The jungle's kind of taken over. There's uh, 50 indigenous species of flora and fauna printed onto the labels at somewhere, the tops or the necks or the front and the back. Um, this is one of the visuals that we've done for a new SKU. Our visuals are pretty tight before we give it to the illustrators. Uh, we tend to work things up pretty well uh, and show how it kind of works all over the place. And then this is the finished bottle. And I am I am staggered at the amount of detail that we can now get on these things. I mean, those bottles at the top of the screen there are like three millimeters high, and you can see the level of print we can get on there. Uh, we use shape, especially on this brand as well. Uh, again, when I started this, the shapes of labels were pretty much rectangular or square, and that was that was what you got. Um, nowadays, we can do all these crazy cutters and interesting shapes. When I look down the wine, lab, wine aisles at the store, and, you know, there are thousands of bottles there, and uh, most of them have gone for rectangular or square labels, which I always think is a little bit of a disappointment. You can do something really interesting by just being off a little bit. Yeah, the shapes on these labels again seem to get crazier and crazier. But this one, I mean, I um, I don't, I look at it now and I'm kind of trying to figure out how they applied it to the bottle because it's, 
if you go and see, watch these labels being peeled off um, at speed, it's, uh, it's incredible to think that something of this intricate cutter can be peeled off and applied to a bottle. Um, yeah, that one's that one pushed it a little bit. So you should always think that you can achieve anything with paper on a bottle and let the production people, the printers and the bottlers figure it out. I think this brand more than any of our projects is a real testimony to the versatility and power of, of paper on bottles. Um, this is what the brand looked like when we met this guy, uh, John, his name is, he owns this range of, this, he develops all this range of whiskies called Compass Box. Um, and people were getting confused because, you know, you stick those on shelves and it starts to become really difficult to kind of see the differences and see the, because they're all in whiskey bottles and they all look whiskey color. And the labels really weren't selling the product enough. Although the names were always amazing. John's fantastic at coming up with names and ideas and tasting notes. And, uh, and we developed with him a way of working, which was around um, a one sentence brief. What is the core of this idea? So he would always kind of give us a name and what this tasted like, and then a kind of a one sentence crazy brief to work with. Um, so the range went from looking like this to looking like this which is much more expressive. Each, each skew is really trying to express what is event, essentially just the same kind of brown colored liquids. So like the one on the left is, he said, this is a really, really rich and lavish three-year-old. So we did a really, really, really rich and lavish number three. Every kind of one that he gives us this little name like um so the spice tree the second one in there he said it was psychedelic elegance so each one of these skews has a little one sentence brief and a huge paper label which we're able then to to express that and we've done i think 40 labels for him over the past 10 years uh, maybe a few more maybe it's 45 now um and they they're all interesting and they're all rich and they're all printed very differently whether it would be one color which is probably more like four but it looks like one um metal inks ton of colors each one of these bottles is a uh, is it's been great to work on it's one of our favorite clients i have to say just because he gives us a lot of free reign And the printing is always is always excellent. Color again, just taking over. And always rich and deep, kind of interesting stories. I always imagine that people, whiskey drinkers, are very um, uh, interested in bottles and labels. They because they the whiskey drinking is quite often a. a, a a reward it's sitting at home you you at the end of the day and you'll have this and you'll look at the labels and uh, and um it's i i kind of think about whiskey drinkers a lot and their bottles and if you look online uh there's a lot of uh, whiskey review sites and blogs uh and um they often just talk about the whiskies uh like on youtube and they'll do these five minute talks about each of the liquids and um, we've actually got to a lot of stage where these guys will actually comment on the labels as well and talk about how the different labels work and feel and what the story is behind the labels, uh, which is which is perfect. I mean, we've done our job. If somebody can think that a label is interesting enough to try, then they'll pick it up and there's a good chance that they'll convert that into a sale. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all about. It's doing the art is great, but you know we need to make sales. So, um, yeah, so after the 10 years, John actually came to us and said, look, you know, we've been working together for 10 years. And I said, really? Well, he said, I would love to do a celebration 
or a, a skew that was that celebrates the fact that we've been working together all this time. I thought that was really lovely. And we talked about kind of what the liquid might be and all this sort of thing. And uh, and Guy, the designer, uh, the design director, he said, um, well, you know, he came up with this idea and it combines the two logos and uh, it was insane. I mean, just how, how do you possibly pr produce something like this? Um, we're, we're very lucky to have incredible production people in the company who can figure out how to get these insane visuals produced properly. And they figured that because it was a tapered bottle, they could actually slide and tack the labels up. So we could use thicker, thick, much thicker stock and see what we could do pushing the techniques that we learned into thicker paper. So this is kind of the artwork that we would do, even again, even though it looks like a one or two colored label, it's actually there's four separate grays there alone to build this, build this killer color up and the foil and the engraving plate and two levels of emboss and a sculpted emboss and a deboss. And it's incredible to me how these papers can hold all these things now so well. Um, that's the plate engraving, some spot varnish, some finishes. We, even in this simple looking label, I think we managed to use 13 or 14 options. And it looks incredible. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, I have one on my desk at all times. And uh, it just uh, can remind me that anything can be achieved. And the, the emboss uh, depths on this look, look like you can ski down them. Um, incredibly rich. Uh, so this is all, all thanks to these amazing papers that we use. So thank you for listening to me. I'm very open to any questions that anybody might have now. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin, for sharing your amazing work with us. We really appreciate it. And we actually do have some questions. So quite a few, actually. So let's start with the first one. Um, do you work with a network of illustrators or are they done in-house? Uh, none of the illustrations are done in-house. Uh, we've always had a really, uh, a really good uh, network. But some some projects call for specialist illustrators and you would definitely find a, a specific style or and then we have a couple of guys who can turn their hands to absolutely anything they're almost like forgers so you can say kind of give us a van gogh of that and they'll go and do it um but the, yeah the images are in, the illustrators are key to us yes uh, the, the the designers will put things together pretty well but it's the illustrators that make these things sing what is the most challenging label you've had to deal with or design? Most challenging. I, I would say um, it's weird because as a designer, and I'm sure the design directors and creative directors, those are exactly the same. They will just design this stuff uh, and then hand it over to uh, the production team. and. Uh, I'm, those guys are probably, I think almost every time they, they look at the visual and go, oh my God, how, <laughs> how are we supposed to do this? Because the designers have a very uh, a great attitude in that they just assume that we can produce anything. So they'll design as the best thing they possibly can. And it's the production people working in tandem with the paper producers and the printers that that really convert this crazy idea into into reality um i think it's the team and i think it's almost every label now that we do it i think the designers are just trying to push it more and more and more uh i think the, the most challenging one is going to be the next one <laughs> yes and your work is i mean that is just your work it's it's so inspirational um so we have a question here um it's um your work is just out of this world, and this isn't the question. What is your experience with digital print technologies on paper, and do you have a preference for printing method, like flexo, offset, et cetera? I think it depends on the project. Digital's getting so much better now, and I think it gets better every year. 
there was a time again, just a few years ago, where you could spot a digital label from a mile off. Um, but it's it's just getting better and better and better now. Uh, I think at some point there's gonna there's gonna be it, it will completely take over uh, because you can customize digital a lot more. You can do really tricky, interesting things with it. Um, customize each label. I mean, it's just uh, it, it, I think it's the future. I think it's still got to catch up a little bit on the finishing and things like that, but it, it's it's definitely the future. And do you ever use cold foil? Yeah, we use every single finish going cold foil. I mean, just every everything going. I, I'll be surprised if there's any single finish that we haven't used. And I think they they uh, the certainly the production guys uh, like the challenge of using anything new that comes in. Like we, we you know we're always scouring the place for new papers and new bottles and new tricks and. And then um, as soon as soon as it comes in, and as soon as people see it, there, there's a kind of a race, I think, within the designers to to use it first. So yeah, we've used every single finish. How do you decide which paper to use to tell your story? Um, well, a lot of that is down to well, you, You've got to think about the uh, where the where this thing is going to end up. So if this is going into an ice box, you your selection is reduced down considerably. Um, if you need to, if you need it to be uh, matte or or gloss, it, it depends on the project. Um, the production guys will always look at it and look at the best way to get it out. And there may be one or two ways of doing that, um, and they'll decide on the paper based on what the visual looks like and the best way that they can get out of out that result. How would you advise to apply creativity through design for inexpensive products which inherently have smaller budgets and need to keep per label print costs down? Yeah, well, we we have done plenty of one color, like true one color projects. Um, I don't think that that should hinder the creative thought process. Uh, the, the key to our process is, is standing out, is looking better or different, uh, more expensive, more interesting story than the bottles around it. And that, although it gets finished off in the print production process, you can express all those kind of ideas with one color on a inexpensive paper. I and mean, we've used newsprint. We've we've done a we've done labels with newsprint. I mean, it's it's that I don't think that that should hinder the creative thought, the production, and the creativity, and the ideas, and the storytelling can be completely um, separate things. You don't have to be lavish. We're very lucky that we get to be lavish quite a lot. In the beginning stages of concepting, do you find yourself having a solid narrative to design around, or does it come or from organically working with the client? Um, we're pretty brutal with clients uh, in that <laughs> we ask them right up front what they stand for and why should anybody care about them. And it, and you get that real, um, you know, you can go real, down a real existential wormhole, like when they're trying to figure out who they are and and, uh, and, and what it is, the big corporate clients are just so far ahead. They've got the background and they've got the research and they've got, they, they come to us almost with a, like a fully formed kind of idea of, of the communication that they're trying to do. The, the, the newbies, the, the ones that are just new to our industry, who are just kind of decided that they would love to open a still or a vineyard or something. Those are the ones that we have to work with more to try and find out what their story is. Because you can't just say, well, it's another medium product made by a medium family in a medium way. I mean, that, <laughs> does, that doesn't work. It's just out there. I don't care what the story is. You can be the tallest dwarf or the most expensive this or the whatever, but you need to have something to, to hang your hat on. And, and it needs to be in one sentence as well. And that's, that's the most difficult thing, trying to get people to get it down to the elevator pitch. What, what do you stand for in one sentence? What do you stand for? And once you've got that, designing is easy. Well, it's not easy, but 
you know, it's the storytelling is easy, um, but getting that story is the tough bit. Your quality of work is absolutely remarkable. How do you set about creating your design work and how long does it take to complete from concept to commercialization? Uh, the paper side of it is relatively fast. I mean, we can get the whole thing together, you know, in a matter of weeks. Uh, but most of what we do, particularly in the liquor and perfume area, you're, you're looking at bespoke bottles and they take six months to, to turn around from like an idea to get them produced to ship to fill um but the paper side of it and the paper story is 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 weeks so i don't know what our exact lead time is right now but the designer might only have um, a few days or a week to put a put a, a complete package together uh, and then it goes off to production and those sorts of things that can take weeks as well and then the printer we work really hard to try and make the paper the easy part for you Sorry? <laughs> we work very hard to make the paper the easy part for you oh it is it is <laughs> more often than not the paper is the easiest part of all of it <laughs> yeah how, how do you test out new embellishments like some of the neck labels and some of the you know metal things and very unique finishes that you put on the bottles um, I think luckily the printers kind of come, or, or uh, paper companies or printers come to us um, with samples that, although they may not be exactly what we want, they might inspire us to go, well, let's try that with this. And then when you've got all these samples and you think, well, if I try that on that and that on that, it, I, I think it's um, it's looking at what they can achieve and they've normally tried to test it and push things and um and uh, they have the the production guys have got so much reference and so much experience and or more importantly they've been on press as well they know how the press works and the processes so uh, yeah we get inspired by things that we see or things that we've seen and sometimes it's producing something that comes from a different era as well when you were using you know letterpress systems from years ago but you know applying multiple finishes on it and you find this old piece of paper and you think how the hell have they done that and we have to kind of reverse engineer and dissect it and think how can we produce it now um, yeah the production guys in our crew are just best in the world best in the world and they uh they they managed to get all this thing done so this question is kind of the opposite of that. How do you see labels in the future? Well, digital, I think, is really interesting. I think uh, get, having to being able to customize labels is really interesting. Uh, I think um, we did a we've done a really uh, a brand called um, Nineteen Crimes, which is augmented reality. So the the labels are criminals, but they actually on your phone they they speak to you and tell you a story and i think where, when a label can be integrated into technology or do something extra uh, i think that's a that's an added bonus um we've done fluorescent labels that are in working clubs and things like that so i think we're always pushing the envelope and uh, the paper companies and the printers are, are helping us with that do you work uh, much with holographic foils and what do you think about this material yeah i think i showed something that was uh, that was done with the holographic foil yeah i mean i think they're amazing i, I for me I, we don't use enough of them I, I'd, I'd love to use a lot more it's just having the having the project that that would suit it um you know, they they they're they're kind of really in your face and they kind of speak to a certain kind of sensibility and uh, about i would i would love to do more of those things anything new I kind of want to use straight away. Yes. What kind of questions do you ask yourself when creating and conceptualizing a story to tell for a brand? What questions do I ask? Um, well, this, it's about if it's about the story, it's uh, is it going to be appealing to people? Uh, and I think you have to stop thinking about yourself and put yourself in the minds of the end user and the consumer that you're trying to aim at. And is this story different to the other stories that are out there? And is there something special about the story? So I'm always querying uh, you know, 
will it sell? That, that's the bottom line for me, because you know we're about, it's unlike any other area of graphic design, we, we need to sell product. And we get the data on those sales on a daily basis. I mean, they're available to us. So you know if a, if a product is going crazy, uh, and that's that's vital for us because then we get a happy client and we get more projects. How do you combat copycat syndrome in such a quick and competitive space? Um, copycat syndrome. Yeah, there's a lot of that around. I think um, some of it is unintentional. I mean, you can't have like uh, there's I think three hundred thirty thousand designers. I think in in um, the US and they're all they're all working at the same time you can't there's some things are just going to have some designers are going to design the same things as others just it's uh, bound to happen if this real plagiarism uh, and it's and it's intentional uh, then our clients are generally all over it and they've got very expensive lawyers to to keep busy yeah so I think we have a Couple more questions. Let's see. Um, how did how did you start out, and how did you name the company? Uh, stranger is a slang word for a moonlight job. Uh, it's uh, there's a stranger in the studio. You know, my best friend and I were were working at night uh, in an agency, and in the evenings we'd do our own stuff. So there were two strangers two stranger projects of the night. And I said, one day I'm gonna, if I ever have a company, that's what I'm gonna call it. <laughs> and it started, uh, it started um, we, uh, kind of weirdly there. Uh, I just quit a firm that I wasn't happy with and uh, accidentally, well, I, I got invited to pitch on a, uh, for a computer company called Dell and, and I won the pitch. So I was working on Dell, which was great, uh, financially amazing, uh, but not creatively that. Good, not for me, enough uh, creativity. So uh, I was at an auction with a friend and we were looking at the wine labels and he said, these labels are terrible. And I thought I can do something about that. So I went up to the nearest distributor who didn't have a budget to wine labels, uh, but I said, I'd do it in exchange for wine, which was amazing. Uh, a truckload of wine turned up. And, um, and the first label, because we'd applied, um, some research in FMCG kind of practice to it kind of really took off went crazy and then we got we just started to get phone calls um, and that that was it really that's a great story well you should uh, if you if you're going to specialize you should specialize in something you really enjoy um, and then one last question how does a project go through your company and how many people work on it uh, it's normally everything goes through the creative director Cosy, who's just a design god, and everything um, then is normally handled by one person per project. Uh, we don't do tons of ideas. Uh, we prefer to concentrate on quality, and uh, and uh, they're supervised by Cos to get to get the most out of them. Um, we'll talk about you know, the direction and the angles sometimes and uh, what is, what's the best way to approach the project. Um, and then we try and kind of uh, distill it uh, down to down to a one sentence brief. And, and I use this example a lot. If, it, if, we, if we would talk about uh, if Chanel did a vodka, you understand that as a brief. You understand who you're aiming it at, you understand how it should be and how it should act and the sensibility. And you give that brief to a designer and they can just go crazy with that kind of brief. Uh, and then one designer generally sees the whole project through and quite often if they're on that, they're on that account for forever. Uh, like Guy has been working on Compass Box for what, decades now? Well, a decade and a bit. And uh, uh, they understand the client and they understand that sector of the market and they really get really deeply embedded and that's as a as specialists That's what we need to do. We need to know every single thing about the market. Uh, that's what our clients pay us for Yes, Kevin, I can't thank you enough for doing this for us today uh, We really appreciate your participation as well as all our attendees from around the globe um, 
We wanted to let you know that our next webinar will be on November 12th and the design agency RBA Design will be speaking on the value of design, some keywords for an effective label. You can follow us on social media to register. Thank you again, Kevin, so much. Um, everyone be you well. You are most welcome. And have a great day. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.